Hello, everyone. How, everybody having a great time at VRLA? Oh my gosh, it's got to be louder than that. Is everybody having a great time at VRLA? Yay, there we go. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to be here um, today. And it's, uh, it was, matter of fact, it was really exciting to be here because when I left Buffalo, it was 18 degrees and it was snowing terribly. So I'm, it was an absolute pleasure uh, to be able to be here today and kind of show you some of the stuff that we're doing with 360 Heroes and, and all about um, the end flow of uh, working with 360 video. So let me just make sure I got the right window here. So what I'm gonna to try to do today is kind of show you a little bit about the different types of rigs that we're using and what we've developed over time. And uh, what I wanna explain is the, the mission of 360 Heroes and what we're here for. And what we wanna do is we wanna create and build and inspire others around 360. We know VR is growing really well and behind that, we've, we've learned a lot of things over time. So I'm gonna kinda of explain to you what has happened to us over the last three years. And a lot of that has been good, been bad, but I want you to give you a little history about where we came from so that you can kinda of see what we wanna inspire into. We're actually founded in 2011, and we actually started working on this uh, in 2007. And a lot of my inspiration came from Steven Spielberg when he said, someday in the not too distant future, you're gonna be able to go to a movie and the movie will be all around you. And the movie will be over your head, 360 degrees, every way you look. And it was very interesting when he said that because I was actually working on a particular project and I was an aerial photographer. Being a pilot and an aerial photographer, I was trying to do a lot of things that were lighter than air solutions. So the problem is, is here you can see I was actually working on a DLSR camera system, but I could only carry 7.2 pounds. And a lot of these concerts and stuff that we were doing at that time, they wanted us to be in the air for a long time, and they said, well, can't you just fly your drone over people, you know, and be able to do this concert? And I'm like, we can't do that. So a lot of it was we used this helium balloon to be able to do that. But then more and more people started asking back then is how can I make the area larger? How can I see everything all around me? And in doing that, we've started messing around and building a whole array of different rigs. And these rigs go from the very basic system, which is like around 200 bucks, all the way up to around $1,000. From 2D, 3D, all sorts of different types of experiences. And with all of that, we learned different things from basically failing many, many times. And what we did was took all those failures and was able to bring it back to you so you could actually see everything that we were doing. Now, just a quick show of hands. How many people here have actually heard of 360 Heroes? Excellent. Okay, how many people here have actually filmed a 360 video of some sort? Great, okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna give you two one minute little videos that kind of tells you about the gear, what it does and how it works. And then I'm gonna tell you about how we physically create it. And then I'm gonna show you the experiences that we did doing that. Okay, 360 Heroes is all around creating content using a GoPro. An average GoPro has a viewing angle of around 170 degrees. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take six of these GoPros, snap them into our 360 Heroes holder, and allow us to be able to create 360 degrees horizontally. And while most 360 video gears can actually see 120 degrees vertically, using our gear, what it allows you to do is see a whole 360 degrees vertically. And what that allows us to do is to be able to see 360 on the horizon in the real world and then at the same time be able to look up, look down, and see everything all around you. And the interesting thing here is I'm actually wearing that gear and talking into the camera. So it, what it allows you to do is be able to hide that gear um, that's not present, which is kind of slick. So you can kind of be able to get really tricky in reference to how you do that. Now, how we actually create 360 video. It gets a little bit more interesting in how that works as well. So we start off first by taking six GoPro cameras. We're gonna pull them out of the holder 
and then we're going to use six micro SD cards inside of there. We use the GoPro remote to be able to turn them on and off um, automatically so that they're somewhat in sync. Now what we're going to do is take these six um, camera cards and we're going to break them out into five different takes. And again, we used a GoPro remote to try to turn these on and off at the same time. Now what we're going to do is take the first take and strip that apart frame by frame. So we got 30 frames per second or 60 frames per second. And we're going to take just one frame out of there. And we're going to move them into a specific orientation and array. Then we're going to warp and distort the video to be able to create one larger video. Then once we take that one larger video, we're going to put it all back together again at 60 frames a second, put it all back into one piece. Then you can take that environment and wrap that around in your spherical world. So you can use an iPhone, an iPad, uh, Android devices, or any other types of devices, or the web, and then view it in all those environments, including the Oculus Rift. So that kind of gives you a quick overview of how we're creating the content. Now, associated with all the different things that we are doing, from 2011 till now, we have done productions all over the world. And we've had some good success and bad success in during all these different adventures. One of the, the really exciting ones, and actually was a childhood dream, is I actually wanted to get in the Guinness Book of World Records, but I did it totally by accident. One of them was, is um, um, back in uh, 2013, um, the Everest Media Production Group says, Mike, we'd like to shoot 360 video on top of Mount Everest. I'm like, okay, um, what is the temperature on the top of Mount Everest? And they said, minus 51 without the windshield. Well, that night, I actually got in trouble with my wife because what I did was took my rigs, went back home, cleaned out my freezer, I stuffed in all the rigs I had and shut it up for the day. And my wife came home and said, who in the world is going to eat all these 50 steaks in one day? But we wanted to find out if the, the rig was going to be able to handle the temperature. So we went up uh, Mount Everest. And we actually hired a crew of three different guys. And these are all the Sherpas that um, are actually going to help us shoot this particular project on top of Mount Everest. And what was interesting was the first guy that we had, he was in the best health. He had everything he needed. He got to base camp number four and just started up that event, and all of a sudden he got altitude sickness. So he almost died. We had to airlift him out. And needless to say, I was safely home in my office on a satellite phone discussing this with everyone. I did not go up there. And they called me up and said, Mike, what are we going to do? We got the whole crew there. And we got to figure out how to get this to happen. I said, well, let's train another Sherpa, and we'll send him up. So while I was talking on the phone, I said, listen, when you get to base camp number four, and again, they're thinking about living. They're not necessarily worried about my little camera. I said, when you get there at base camp number four, just take it out for me, make, turn it on, make sure it works, OK, and then continue the trek the rest of the way up. That's exactly what he did. He came back to base camp number four. We looked at the footage. And all I seen and heard was pitch black, and heard him go, quick, quick, quick. So he got the base camp number four. He turned the cameras on, and he forgot to turn them off, and trekked to the top of Mount Everest. And got up there. The batteries were dead, of course. Okay. So now they called me back up, and there's a 10 week window to try to be able to accomplish this. So we got two and a half weeks left. And they called me up. I said, what are we going to do? I said, well, third time's a charm. Let's see what happens. So we trained the third Sherpa. And he went up to the top of Mount Everest. And he made it. He actually got 45 minutes of footage on the top of Mount Everest. The problem is, is we got all the footage back. And I said, this is what you're supposed to do. When you get up there, what I want you to do is just, it's a 360 camera. All you got to do is turn it on, hold it up, and let it film. So what he did. Turned it on, held it up, and went. <laughs> <laughs> and the interesting thing was, we had 45 minutes of footage like that. <laughs> and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> so um, 
one of the things that we've learned about all the different things, especially in this particular job, was how do we make this new technology easier for people to deal with? And we also worked on the scenario of how do you stabilize 360 video footage? And out of that 45 minutes, we managed to get 26 seconds of stable footage, which I doubled the length. And then we actually got a phone call from London saying, oh, by the way, you made it to the Guinness Book of World Records. So it was a very interesting, unexpected adventure. But it was so much that we learned about that. And we've taken all those types of experiences and passed it in some of the newer things that we've done. For example, here's another thing that we were doing with uh, Visa in the 2014 Winter Olympics. The camera only weighs 1.6 pounds. But when you're an athlete, you're trying to wear this particular gear, it takes just a little bit to throw off your balance. So a lot of this was is experimenting with different types of helmets. How do you wear it? How do you position it? How do you put it in the right place to be able to film with it? Because you, know, you can get into the whole package for around $3,000 to $4,000. And, but when you go out and film and you're trying to capture that moment, you want to make sure that the gear is doing what you expect the gear to do. And that's some of the stuff that we're going to kind of go through today. The other thing that we're also trying to do is, for example, with Time Magazine uh, and uh, Fabian Cousteau, was is how do you tell a story? When you're actually looking and working with someone in this environment, how do, how do you tell, it's 360, so how do you tell them where to look and view in that environment? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a little bit, this is part of a deep dive. In. Okay, so here, what they're talking about is use your mouse and you can kind of navigate around inside of the environment. You can actually go to Time Magazine and, and go to this particular website and experience this yourself. But what we, what we did was is I can kind of move around and see everything in the environment and we put a coordinate system going on. So we're telling the people in the audio, turn to zero degrees and see Fabian Cousteau um, drinking his coffee. Or at the same time, we can spin around and turn to um, 125 degrees and see Billy Snook, the dive partner, actually com com being part of the dive. So it allows people to be able to experience all this in the wet porch and kind of we're using the coordinate systems to kind of navigate you around in that type of environment to tell the story. Now, what's really interesting about this, too, is we can also put this in flat view. So this is what the video actually looks like. OK, so in its flat view mode, it's two to one ratio. So most video formats that we're looking at is a 16:9 format. OK. So this is a two to one format. All the gear that, we're having, that we have here, everything that, stitch, that we have can stitch out to 8,000 by 4,000 pixels. Now everybody says, oh my gosh, 8,000 by 4,000 pixels, well we can only play 2K and 4K. Well, we want to think into the future. S film the stuff at the max, and then down compress it to the environment that you want to use. So here, I'm going to take the flat view, and I'm going to put it into uh, basically the little planet view, so you can actually see how it's actually created. And then we can actually zoom in and out and see that type of environment. And we'll try to slide this back over here. Okay. Some of the other things that we've done is that we've, we've evolved in our underwater type of work. And a lot of the things that we've discovered is that sometimes you have success and sometimes you have failures. And what we've learned that is that if you do have, try to be able to adapt, figure out what you did wrong, and then try to fix it. For example, we were in <laughs> New Zealand here. And we, were, we flew the whole crew out. And it was really exciting because we were in the water for less than two minutes. And we forgot to put the safety cable on. And needless to say, this is now 800 feet down. And yes, he ate my $10,000 prototype rig. Um, and if you notice, you know, the little domes are popping off. You know, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, what, what are we going to do? You know, this is, it's, it's, 
It's really, you know, the diver's looking down, he's going, I ain't going to get that. Are you going to get that? Uh, you know? So these are the things that we've learned over time on how to try to fix and adapt. And we'd like to share this with you, not only because, you know, it's kind of funny, but um, it, it allows us to see that, you know, with failure becomes great success. And because of this little thing here, it actually got me featured on Fox and CNBC and all sorts of other places uh, to tell about spherical video. So it was, it was a very interesting experience with that. But now if you, you get into the why you really want to do underwater uh, technology. And um, I want to thank uh, Bill McDonald for this. As a matter of fact, Bill, if you could stand up real quick. Um, Bill McDonald is a 2014 Nogi Award winner. And he's done incredible things in, in working with the environment underwater. And Bill is actually one of my testers of the 360 Abyss, the version 4 rig that we actually have up here. And it's, it, take, it took us several renditions to try to get it right. But what's really nice about this technology that we have today, and compared to the older technology, is what we can do with this gear um, without ever touching the cameras. So for example, in the past, when we were filming with this gear, we would have to be able to turn the cameras on before we would leave in the boat, dive in, swim like heck to our particular um, project underwater, hope the GoPros are gonna to continue to run that long, okay? Not that I'm saying anything bad about the GoPro stuff because I absolutely love the gear, but it's just the technology that we're dealing with. Well, what's really nice now about this particular gear, and we'll show you after the show, is we can take now a little blue magic wand. And in inside of this particular item is a small magnetic sensor. And this is actually introducing a new 360 control board that we have that allows us to lock all the GoPros together. So because it allows us to lock together, we can actually take the magnet, we can actually slightly hold up against the outside, and it automatically turns the cameras on all of them together, which is really cool. And then I can just touch it just once more like this. Give it a second, if I held it here long enough. And there we go, we can actually start filming if we wanted to. Or I can turn around and hold the camera up against the, the side and turn it off underwater without ever touching the gear. So this gives us, we've learned a lot and matter of fact, this one, I told Bill, I says, listen, whenever you want to go back out and try to get some shark footage, um, this camera can be eaten, and um, hopefully we won't lose anything um, from the domes on this one, which is good. But all of this leads into holding the gear. There's different things that you want to be able to uh, be prepared with. Because when you're working with this gear, you want to make sure that you capture the moment correctly. And just because of lens parallax, and does everybody here understand when I say lens parallax? Show of hands, okay? Basically what that means is, is if you hold your thumb out in front of you, okay, this far away, and you look with the left eye and look with the right eye, there's a change in the background. And when you hold your thumb farther out in front of you and look with the left and the right, it changes. So for example, in this particular view, there's multiple ways on the bottom of our mounts, there's three different mount figures for each one of our holders. And it's all done specifically in certain ways. For example, the figure on the left, the camera is pointed directly at the actor or the person that's holding the gear. The one on the right, the, the, the mount is different so that we're looking in front of us. That's more important than the talent that's actually holding the gear. And the reason why you want to do that and you want to get it right is because if you plan on jumping off a bridge, you want to make sure the gear is properly mounted. Or if you're at a special scene with a tiger, you don't want to get back to the studio and realize that you're, you just filmed directly on the scene. So if you take a look at this particular picture that you have here, If he had the camera turned the wrong way and it was on the seam, now the lion is not going to be properly in the stitch. So it's really understanding the different ways to being able to film with the gear. Here's another thing. Flying it below a drone, okay? 
again, the unit only weighs 1.6 pounds, so you can carry it below a drone. And usually the DJI 750 or higher will be able to carry this gear without a problem. There was a problem that I had when we were working with this gear. And one of the things was, is this is a great experience because I can actually be flying below the drone and I see the drone, okay? Which is really cool. So I can pan, tilt, zoom around, kind of get in and out and see everything that's with that experience. But I was assessed. I, I'm just like, there's got to be a way to get that, that helicopter out of the picture. How, how in the world can we do that, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slide this back over here. And with our engineering group, we turned around and we built this, okay? This is the flying orb. And we had all sorts of problems that we figured out when we were trying to mess with this thing, okay? And we actually built this about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, and the problems were we, we put all the cameras on there, but we had to deal with vibration and harmonics. And how do you get all that stuff out of there? But how, do you, how can you utilize all that? Well, after numerous, numerous attempts, we figured it out. And we were able to do something like this. So here we are, flying around. You can look straight down and look up, gone. So the experience now, what allows us to do is notice there's a lot, a lot of vibration here. There's very little video stabilization done here. We just used the normal gyro on the particular copter, okay, and flew the experience. But what really I thought was really cool and my daughter told me this, who's 13 years old, who's just, or excuse me, 10 years old, and, and she just literally said, you know, um, Dad, I truly feel like a flying Superman now. Okay, because you can look everywhere and see and experience everything that's all around you. So that's some of the fun stuff that um, we have learned. And what we like to do is in our training courses, which we're going to help with VRLA coming up here, we're going to teach you all these experiences that we did and show you the things and the problems that we run into over time so that when you get a hold of this type of technology, you can see our flagship models that we're doing here. We've created 12 different types of rigs, and these are our, our three most famous rigs. The rig in the middle is called the Pro 7, and it actually um, is used for a lot of real estate, virtual reality real estate. And the reason why is when we go to film with that, and I, I have the Pro 10 one up here. This is actually the newest of the Pro 10. But when you go to film with this gear, a lot of it is, is you want to be able to keep all the cameras on the horizon. So if you notice on this particular one, we've got 10 cameras, and we've got seven cameras on the horizon. So what we want to do is we want to film with it just like this, okay? So that we capture everything on the horizon. This particular rig stitches out at 12,000 by 6,000 pixels, okay? And with the four blacks, you can get that at uh, 60 frames a second. Uh, and get some incredible content with that. Now, what's really exciting is we've built this technology for the Abyss to be able to turn it on remotely. Um, the GoPro remotes sometimes work and sometimes they don't. And so the lot of it is, is how do we get away from that? So what we've done is we've built our new called Bullet 360 board. The Bullet 360 board is inside of the Abyss gear and it's also in our newest prototype, which we have sitting up here, and it's going to be injected molded. So here in the next uh, two months or less, you're going to be able to buy this in bulk quantity and a lot cheaper. So we're going to be able to lower the prices and be able to have everyone take advantage of that. I thought those guys were clapping at me when I told you to lower the prices. Oh, all right. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's our goal is to lower the prices and to help you out um, with that. And so this is our actually our new Pro 10, and we're going to do it with all of our rigs to be able to do that, which leads to our Abyss 4, which we were talking about earlier. And these, this Abyss 4, I think, is uh, are going to really help us with everything out there, okay? So a lot of that is, is uh, that's how we really wake people up from sleeping on my presentation. 
Um, a lot of the issues with this is they're individual camera compartments, so that if one camera, um, one dome failed or one O-ring failed or whatever, I'm only losing one camera, not six. The other thing is this is rated to 1,000 meters, so we can go 3,000 feet with that. And what it allows you to do is do experiences like this. So here you can see the abyss out in front of the sub. They can control all of this remotely from within inside the sub. And because of the different mechanisms that we've built uh, around the abyss, it allows you to be able to control and do anything you want within the environment that you want. And for example, here's um, Adam, one of the uh, people that uh, Bill works with, actually tied on to one of the dive extras rigs that we have out in front here. And what it allows you to do is be able to experience um, this inside of environment. That's kind of neat here. You can see Adam kind of having fun in the pool, pulling himself around and getting some different types of experiences with this. And this is just some experimental footage that we were trying to show you in reference to what you can do with this gear underwater. So where does it go from here? We basically have a production environment. We have a camera file management environment. We have video stitching. We also have other post techniques to be able to clean up the gear. But what's more important is that is the first two scenarios. And that is, is media management. So as you can imagine, if I'm shooting with this Pro 10 rig, okay, and I have 10 cameras and 10 takes, I'm dealing with 100 files. Now, how many people here actually have my 360 Heroes gear? Okay. Uh, how many times have the GoPros worked 100% of the time when you hit the remote? No hands. Okay. So, and it's not, again, it's not to say anything bad about the, the, the cameras, it's sometimes it doesn't work. Okay. So, what Cam Man does is that when, if you shot 10 takes and you got 100 files and it goes to start to ingest the files, what it allows you to do is use these multi port readers. So you can take all these cards and stick them in and ingest all this data all at once. And during the data ingest inside, it's actually counting all of the takes and the frames and everything that with each one of the videos that's coming into the scenario. So that when you go to look at the videos, it will actually say, hey, just to let you know, while on set, out of these 10 takes, take three and seven didn't work. And you can do that inside of about 10 to 15 minutes. So now you know you can safely walk away from the set and either reshoot that or not reshoot that. The other thing that we've done, if you shoot for a long time with the GoPros, okay, you have a four gig limit. Okay? It's actually not the GoPro that causes the problem, it's the, the fat iOS file management side that causes the problem. But what we allow you to do is that if you have 30 minutes of footage, we can take all of those four gig files and put them into one big monster file that might be 20, 30 gigs, and then you can stitch that whole scenario if you want. The other thing what it allows you to do is take um, your existing cameras that you have. If you, if you don't have Cam Man on site and you just said copy all the files into camera one folder, copy all the files into camera two folder, and so forth, this will take all those folders and put it into a format that's very easily manageable. So it really helps you to do that type of content easier. The other thing it allows you to do is technology is constantly changing. We have uh, the DK1, the DK2, the new Samsungs. Um, we have different types of players. We have web players and so forth. What this allows you to do is when you get done stitching, you can drop this software back in here and tell it what device that you want it to play it on, whether it's these types of devices or large drones, and it'll automatically take that footage and prepare it for that environment for you automatically. So if you're moving from different types of headgear or phones or Androids, it'll actually know how to be able to bring um, that to the proper viewable format. The other thing that we like to do for all the people that have our gear, and even people that don't have our gear, is we have a free iOS uh, app for both iOS and Android, and we have a, a CDN network. Now here, this, in this picture here, every area is the amount of producers that are working with us throughout the United States in the last two and a half years, of the world, excuse me. As you can see, there's a lot of producers and a lot of content that are part of our network, and we all share in reference to what we're trying to do. 
what I'm very proud to say too with our, our CDN syndication network is that we license the content for the for our producers and we've successfully been able to license just shy of $200,000 worth of content for the producers. And we, we have the whole legal team on board with us so that you upload your content, it's free. If someone wants to buy it, we'll handle all the legalese and take care of it for you. And then the money shows up in your PayPal account. So it makes it much easier for you to try to recoup the expenses that you're experimenting with. Um, on here, well, I've also heard um, Upload VR was telling me that um, between all the videos out there, there's over 80,000 360 video um, content created with our gear worldwide. Uh, so that was really exciting news in reference to what we're trying to do. So again, you can also download the app um, that for both iOS and Android. And then one of the things that we also do is we drive around the country teaching people about this technology. Last year, we did 22,000 miles and 18 events throughout the year. Um, and we use um, Big Bertha there on the side that ate my gear. She deserved the right to be on the side of my bus, seeing that she, she ate my gear. And then we have the, the Mount Everest stuff that we did on the other side. But one of the things that we do for that is we like to use this bus to be able to teach travel and tourism, how to do VR real estate, how to educate people in the ecosystems that are out there, uh, virtual training for diving. Imagine being able to go diving or someone that could not even go diving that's sitting in a wheelchair that wants to experience what it's like to swim underwater. So it just gives you incredible inspiration on some of the things that we can do. Um, some of the VR training that we're gonna be due for VRLA, um, and that's coming up in February, um, we're actually gonna show you how we create all the different types of work uh, that we've actually done. So it, it's, it's fun and exciting, and we, we like to be able to share all this with everyone. Any questions? Yes? There is a Mac and a, a PC version. Yep, for both. Yep, anybody else? Stereo. We do uh, both 3D as well as uh, horizontal 3D. Um, as well as uh, horizontal and vertical 3D. We, and we have those rigs at our booth downstairs. You can see all them. It's up to 14 cameras to be able to do the 3D work. Next. The, it, it is tricky. I, I will tell you that there is an art to it, but we sell what they call a Pro 12H. And that particular model, what that allows you to do is um, it stitches 3D on the horizon, but it shares the top and bottom camera. So the left and right eye, when you go to stitch, these two will match perfectly. But when you look on the horizon, it's beautiful 3D. So and that's done with 12 cameras. Yep. Okay, yes, that, that, it is a challenge, okay? But I, I wanna say that I, I'm really excited about what AMD is doing and NVIDIA is doing because they can now, uh, between the different types of cards and stuff that they're using in the existing laptops, this laptop that I have right here can do tons of stitching and things like that to be able to do that. I'd recommend 32 gigs of RAM, at least uh, an SSD drive, um, like a 500 gig or something like that, so as it's stitching, you know, you're getting your fastest frame rate, but you can get about 23 to 26 frames a second. Uh, stick. Yes, yep, I do all of this right off this ASUS laptop here. Yep, yep. Uh, I'll say that again. Um, actually, we're changing that right now. The, the, when I first started to do this, to do you know, one minute of stitching used to take me about a week and a half, okay? Uh, when I first started back in 2000, I think it was like 2010, was the first one that I've ever done. Um, now I can do the whole process using CamMan and uh, take a one minute video from shooting to stitching to uploading to the CDN and playing it for the world to see it on the app. I can do it in less than 12, 13 minutes. 
So the streamline is, is happening. But I understand video. I understand graphics. So once you get taught the, te the, the techniques, anybody can do it. You know, and with the newer cards and stuff that we're doing um, with the Bullet 360 board, it really makes it easy for people to do that. Yes? Yeah, that is, a, that is a very good question, okay? One of the things that we do with our content network is that we tell everybody to upload all of your content today in 4K. We want you to stitch all your content at 8K. If you're using the content, stitch it at the maximum resolution. Trust me on this, because this has come back and helped us greatly for selling our content and using the content later. But one of the things that you can do is, on our iOS app, when you go to grab the video, you can say 1K stream, 2K stream, uh, 4K, or 2K download, or 4K download, all right? Every device is different. Um, we've learned, uh, actually, the hard way on the Androids because I thought I mastered it, and next thing you know, you know, the video doesn't play on three different Android devices, okay? But it's all with trial and error. But when you upload the content in 4K, to our particular servers, we actually convert that one upload to nine different formats. So they're recognizing iOS, we're recognizing you know, all the different types of browsers, and then we, when you go to browse it from us, you can change it. Now, with the advent of YouTube 360 and uh, Facebook 360, you know, they're gonna help us with that greatly. But one of the things that we try to do at 360 Heroes is give you the ability to do all this in a one-stop shop uh, and experience all that so you can literally see what it takes behind the scenes to pull all that stuff off. Anybody else? Yep. Uh, I guess uh, I would like uh, to uh, have a, a greater discussion about syncing the GoPros. Like, what are your, um, you know, just techniques? Tricks. Yep. Yeah, okay. Um, well, if you're doing it underwater, it's actually really easy because the, the diver is breathing. And he's literally putting the audio of him breathing on every single one of the cameras. Um, so that's awesome. But one of the things that we did, and, and I'm, actually I'm very glad you brought that up, is our new control boards um, have a built-in audio buzzer. So that when you click the to start recording, three seconds later it emits a four high pitched tone and it actually puts spikes in every single one of the audio and then you can use the audio to line up and you got it. The, our control boards are not gen locked. Um, we're working on a gen lock version right now. Um, the version of GoPro and the OS that they have on the GoPro doesn't allow good two way communication. But what the control boards do today at 120 frames a second, it's plus or minus five frames when they go to turn it on. So it's much closer than the GoPro remote now, which could be anywhere between 50 to 200 frames off. Well, th just so you know, 360 Heroes is, is not an affiliate of GoPro, okay? We're just a, a separate company, okay? Um, but we work with all of their hardware, okay? And there's gonna be an announcement at NEB coming up um, of some new rigs that we have that's gonna be working with camera systems that are absolutely incredible for dynamic range um, as well as resolution. So we're gonna be able to release those two, ho the, the announcement of the two holders probably in about a month, month and a half. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I was just thinking about um, the, the side of you that you shared with uh, the company and contrasting the, the logos with the Yep. The, we all of that was done in post work in After Effects. So all we did was lay on the grid, just the, the, the compass grid, we just laid it on directly. And then inside of the player, when the player goes back, we track the audio mix, um, uh, the audio mix to the position. So when we said turn to 30 degrees in the player, we physically forced the video. We took the video over, turned it to 30 degrees, and then it continued to play from there. 
So you can actually control the player on your own, and then, uh, and then we release it because we want, we, we physically say, you know, turn to 35 degrees. So we'll force it to that position, okay, and then we let go. And then we let them continue to be able to look around and experience that environment. It's a little harder, though, on, like, the, the gear VRs and stuff because I can't physically turn the person, okay? And if I, we've actually done some experiments, um, and, and kids are great to experiment this on because, you know, they can handle it. But if you try watching the Gear VR, don't move, okay? And if I move the video for you, you will get sick. You'll get vertigo almost instantly. So it's, it's hard when in the Gear VR format to solve that problem. That, yep? Um, is anything being done in like the directional microphone space? There is, yeah. Uh, 3DIO is one of the companies we work with in, um, one of the very first projects we ever worked on in 2013 was uh, uh, Beck. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that particular project that we did, but that was uh, 3D audio sound mixed with video all the way around so that while you were experiencing it, you could look this way and see the instruments, and as you turn your head, the sound would change as you go to move, okay? Um, we actually have one of these rigs in our booth downstairs. And it's kind of cool to feel it because you can kind of, it's the real looking ears, 3D printed. And it's, excuse me, it uses eight mics to be able to capture all that environment all the way around. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate it. Come on down and see our booth.